cleaned up very quickly. <laughs> We're probably waiting for this. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, let's move. We're moving chairs. <laughs> Sasha is moving chairs. She's redecorating the room. <laughs> no, she isn't. She's down. <laughs> I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center, and it is wonderful to have so many good friends of long standing here for today's workshop, especially the Ratiu family and their friends, whose partnership we truly treasure. Nikolai and Sasha Ratiu are both here, as are Elliot Sorel, uh, senior advisor to the Ratiu Award, and Saad Ibrahim. Uh, where is Saad? We were looking. Oh. Coming, coming, uh, who received this prize in 2006, the first year the workshop was held at the center. Uh, the Ian Ratu Democracy Award Workshop is a long-running collaboration between the Wilson Center, the Ratu Center for Democracy, and the Ratu Family Charitable Foundation. It honors those who show a deep commitment to democracy in the spirit of the late Ian Ratu and the spirit of the late Woodrow Wilson, and it offers their message a platform in Washington. We have a great program ahead. You'll hear keynote remarks from Dr. Jamil Hassanli, a former Wilson Center scholar and this year's Ratiu Award winner. He's an exceptional historian, a former member of parliament in Azerbaijan, and one of his country's most important advocates for, for democratic reform. With this award, he joins impressive company. The award has been given to Mustafa Nayem, who helped spark the Maidan revolution in Ukraine, to Nabi, Na, Nabil Rajab, a vital independent voice in Bahrain, and to Aung San Suu Kyi, who just last month led Burma's National League for Democracy to an historic election victory. The takeaway, democratic change can happen if you are brave and determined. Today we have two panels asking what the future holds for Azerbaijan. We've done a number of programs on that question, especially on energy, and our speakers, including three former U.S. ambassadors, are ex exceptionally well qualified to answer it. First up is a conversation on Azerbaijan's place in American policy in the Caucasus. That discussion will be led by Dr. Corey Welt, Associate Director of the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at GW's Elliott School of International Affairs. He'll also introduce the panel's distinguished speakers to this audience. Please join me in welcoming the Ratiu family and in welcoming this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Jane and to the Wilson Center, to the Ratiu family, uh, my colleague uh, Elliot Sorrell is instrumental in putting uh, this program together. Um, and uh, also I just want to say that it's a great honor uh, and privilege to be able to be part of this um, uh, uh, presentation and, and ceremony honoring uh, the work of Dr. Jamil Hassan Lee. I uh, know Dr. Hassan Lee first and foremost as a scholar, uh, an author of, uh, of a remarkable set of books. Uh, with regard to Cold War history, Azerbaijan, uh, Soviet Azerbaijan, and its uh, uh, relationships with Iran. I've learned a lot from his work. I, have, I hold it in uh, high regard, as I do his, uh, his, his political engagement. It's a pleasure to see you. Um, it's been quite a week, even, for, for Azerbaijan. Uh, our hearts, of course, go out to the, the victims of a horrible oil rig fire um, just a few days ago. Uh, the victims and their families and the people of Azerbaijan. Uh, it's also uh, a, a time when we commemorate the uh, a one year imprisonment of Khadija Ismailova. Um, there has also been uh, a, a raid, clashes in the village of Nardaran, uh, and arrests of uh, individuals that the government asserted were uh, Islamists. Um, and uh, amid all of this uh, bad news, we also had a few weeks ago uh, the opportunity to welcome the release from prison of Arif. Uh, Yunus, which was a very uh, promising sign. And, and all of these events speak to the variety of ways in which 
uh, the United States has been engaged in Azerbaijan for now uh, 20 years or so uh, in terms of energy, uh, in terms of security issues, and of course in terms of issues regarding democracy and human rights. I can think of no better panel to open uh, this event with uh, than, uh, than the one we have today featuring three ambassadors. Uh, Ambassador Morningstar will be with us uh, uh, for part of the panel and unfortunately we'll have to leave early so I will be inviting him to speak uh, first followed by Ambassador Kozlorich and Ambassador Yalowitz. Uh, just briefly, Ambassador Richard Morningstar is the founding director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council and served as the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Azerbaijan from 2012 to 2014, and he also served as the Secretary of State's Special Envoy for Eurasian Energy. Uh, Ambassador Richard Kozlorich is the co-director of the Center for Energy Science and Policy and an adjunct professor at George Mason University, previously served as a National Intelligence Officer for Europe <laughs> on the National Intelligence Council, and he served as the, U the ambassador to Azerbaijan from 1994 to 1997, and then in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Ambassador Kenneth Yalowitz is a global fellow at the Wilson Center. Uh, he retired as the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth College in 2011. Uh, he's uh, an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and my alma mater, Stanford, that's Washington campus. Uh, and Ambassador Yalowitz served as ambassador to Georgia from 1998 to 2001, and also before that, to Belarus. So uh, I very much look forward to our conversation. Ambassador Morningstar. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Corey. Uh, let me first uh, add my condolences as well uh, to the victims of the rig fire uh, in, uh, in the Caspian. Uh, obviously a very terrible accident and our hearts go out to them. Uh, let me also say that it is a real privilege to be here uh, with Dr. Jamil Hassanli. Uh, I met with Jamil several times, even well before he was a candidate in the 2013 election. Uh, I spoke to him in his role as a true history scholar and one of the world's leading experts on Cold War history. I think Corey's comments uh, were uh, were very, very well taken. Uh, I spoke to the uh, Helsinki Commission some weeks ago, and uh, I might just briefly summarize some of the things that I said there. Uh, and there are some new things that have happened since then, and uh, I'll briefly comment, uh, briefly comment on those. Um, I do want to emphasize uh, that I speak as somebody uh, who first visited Azerbaijan 20 years ago uh, and somebody who has great respect and admiration for the country, uh, for its people, its many accomplishments, and its majestic beauty. As I said at the Helsinki Commission, I do look at our bilateral relationship with, with some disappointment. It seems as though, despite the fact that our countries have common very common strategic interests, our relationship remains problematic. And I think the two major factors that have con contributed to that deterioration are human rights issues, particularly since the presidential election in 2013, which of course Dr. Hassanli participated in, uh, and the United States criticism of the Azerbaijani government at that time. And second, I think the second issue has been the relative lack, well, not the relative lack of progress, the lack of progress uh, towards a settlement uh, of the longstanding dispute uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh. So as I said then, a few weeks ago, uh, for some time there really has been, I think, a vicious circle in our relationship. Uh, Azerbaijani rights violations, U.S. criticism of those violations, over-the-top Azerbaijani reactions, more issues, more criticism. And I think we've been like two ships passing in the night uh, when, it comes, uh, when it comes to these issues. Um, I certainly empathize with the plights of uh, several prisoners, uh, including the Yonases. Uh, and uh, one good thing, as you mentioned, Corey, that's happened in the past several weeks since the uh, since I spoke at the Helsinki Commission, was the release of Arif to uh, house arrest. Uh, I hope the same will happen very shortly 
uh, with respect to Layla. If for no other reason than humanitarian reasons, uh, she's obviously in very poor health, and there just can be no benefit to the Azerbaijani government in keeping, in my view, in keeping her in prison, nor was there in arresting the Eunices in the first place. But in any event, uh, that hopefully from the human side, uh, she will be uh, she will be shortly released. So that was a positive step, but again, it's one step, and hopefully there'll be a lot more. I do think that it is very important that the United States and Azerbaijan break out of this vicious circle, and that may be in the best, <clears throat> and that may be the best way ultimately to deal uh, with the democracy and human rights issues. I think the result of uh, the, the result of this situation is understandable. It has been, uh, I think, the policy of at least very senior levels of the U.S. government uh, to be indifferent towards Azerbaijan. Uh, and that, that's understandable, uh, given, uh, you know, given, the, given the issues that have come up. And I think there are some <clears throat> there are some in the government who would say, well, why deal with Azerbaijan, given, you know, what they've been doing? You know, we have enough, enough issues on our plate. Uh, why, uh, um, why bother with them? Uh, I think there are reasons, and I, and, and I think that it is important that a high-level dialogue take place uh, between, between our two countries, in which both countries realistically assess their strategic interests in, uh, uh, with, respect, uh, with respect to the other. And I think that there are strategic interests that the United States has, when it come, whether it be energy, whether it be uh, uh, counterterrorism, security, uh, security type issues. Uh, I also think that uh, Azerbaijan has, should have a great interest in having a good relationship with the United States. But I think that that relationship will depend on, I think, ultimately, on at least some significant progress on, on democracy and uh, democracy and human rights issues. Not that we can have no relationship uh, or should have no relationship, but it's going to be a lot stronger relationship um, if there's progress in that area. So in that light, let me just make a few comments on things that I think that have changed uh, since that Helsinki Commission meeting. Uh, I, I think the dialogue has begun to some extent any event, in any event. Um, in that it, we had a Deputy Assistant Secretary Bridget Brink and a delegation was in uh, Baku and raised all of the issues that, uh, uh, that we're talking about right across, right, ac right across the horizon, uh, the broad horizon. and. Uh, recognizing and hopefully uh, conveying that it is important that we uh, uh, that we have a di that we have a really meaningful dialogue and relationship i think there is something else that's changed and i would like to think it could have a positive effect on the us azerbaijan relationship and ultimately uh, ultimately on democracy and human rights issues issues and um, that's the current crisis between russia and turkey uh, and, you know, clearly uh, Azerbaijan has to be careful uh, with respect uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this situation. I think it has been, uh, it, it has been taking a relatively neutral role uh, with respect to uh, what's going on. I think it is important that Azerbaijan uh, maintain, given the neighborhood that it's in, uh, that it maintain relations uh, with uh, both uh, uh, with both good relations with both countries. I think there could be some positive fallout. There aren't too many silver linings in what's going on between Turkey and Russia, but I think there could be some positive fallout. Um, certainly, from Turkey's standpoint, uh, it only reinforces, I think, the need. Uh, for uh, for a southern for a southern gas corridor and the importance the importance of that southern gas corridor, which is a benefit for Azerbaijan. At the same time, I think Azerbaijan needs to be wary of Russia's intentions and possible pressure 
relating to could re that pressure could relate to energy, given Azerbaijan's energy relationship with Turkey. Um, <clears throat> it uh, could relate to Nagorno-Karabakh. It could be a lot of pressure by Russia on Azerbaijan to take sides vis-a-vis uh, -vis Turkey, uh, all of which uh, create a problem. For that reason, I think it's increasingly important that Azerbaijan and the United States have a strong strategic relationship. And the United States, as it always has done, uh, speak up for the sovereignty and independence of Azerbaijan, uh, which it has, as I say, always has over the past 20, 25 years. So you're saying, oh, there goes Ambassador Morningstar talking about energy again and talking about strategic stuff and, and uh, not, worrying, not worrying about democracy and human rights. I think that this could have a positive effect on the democracy and, <coughs> and human rights side because democracy and human rights has to be part of any dialogue uh, between uh, the United States and Azerbaijan. The Azerbaijanis truly do believe that we're looking for regime change, or, to, or some in Azerbaijan, I should say, some in the government, truly believe that we're seeking regime change and trying to, over, and trying to overthrow the government. Certainly the Russians fill them with that kind of garbage every, every day. Uh, and that's just not true. That's just none of our business, and that's for the people uh, for the people of Azerbaijan. But to have a strong relationship uh, between our countries, I think it's critically important that democracy and human rights be a major part of the dialogue. But beyond that, Azerbaijan should lighten up and recognize that many of the things that it has done, forgetting the values argument, which I think is obviously important, but that many of the things that they've done are totally unnecessary and have only served to create this vicious circle, um, vicious circle in our, our relationship. And that it's ultimately in Azerbaijan's interest to breathe more life uh, into civil society, that that will create more stability, that there is no reason why most of the many all or all of those political prisoners need to be in jail. I, I don't want to talk about the Nardaran situation because I just don't know enough about it and understand enough about it uh, to, you know, to comment in any uh, meaningful way. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know, Islamic extremism, if it's there, can be a problem in Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan just like anywhere else, but I, I, I don't know enough to comment on, on, on that part. But <clears throat> there's certainly, I would argue that the government certainly is going after the wrong people when it puts in jail a lot of the people who have been put in, and from, even from a stability argument, again, totally unnecessary. So that needs to be part of the discussion. There needs to be or should be a strong relationship between our two countries. We should be strategic partners. We should be speaking up for the sovereignty and independence of Azerbaijan. It should be up to the people of Azerbaijan as to what its future is. Uh, um, and at the same time, uh, if we're going to have a strong relationship, it's, I think, very important that uh, uh, even if for pragmatic reasons that Azerbaijan's government lighten up. Thank you very much for those opening remarks. Uh, I've set the stage. If you haven't covered everything, let's see. I invite uh, Ambassador Kozlorich to add to the discussion. Thanks a lot. And uh, it's, it's great to be here at the Wilson Center. Uh, this organization has a long history um, generally, but particularly on Azerbaijan. Glad to see Jan Koletsky here, who has done so much to keep the energy part of this relationship alive and so it's it's always fun to come back here because I feel like I'm I'm among friends but I, I do want to echo uh, uh, Ambassador Morningstar's uh, expression of condolences on the deaths of, of the the oilmen uh, offshore that that is a tragedy and for those of us who have been out to those rigs we know what a risk they take 
to help Azerbaijan become a prosperous and hopefully democratic society. And at the same time, we should be w remembering too, as, as Ambassador Morningstar mentioned, the political prisoners who are being held. Um, I, I just want to echo the, the, uh, the expression of concern about Leila Yunus. Um, she should not have been arrested and she should be released and there's no reason why that cannot happen. Um, so uh, with, with that in mind, uh, uh, Jimmy, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here uh, to, to recognize you. I, I wish it wasn't for this reason. Mm -hmm. I, I wish it wasn't because you are a hope for a democratic future of Azerbaijan. Um, I wish we could be here to honor you for your work as a historian. If anyone has not read At the Dawn of the Cold War, given the opening that we're pursuing with Iran, it's time to look at that. It, it, is, it is a fantastic story and uh, revealing, I think, about what goes on today. Uh, but that's not why we're here. Um, I think the, uh, the award of the Ian Ratyud uh, Democracy Award uh, for Dr. Hassani is, is well-deserved. Um, and um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about this uh, future of Azerbaijan. Um, I, I kind of wonder, in a, in a sense, why I'm here today. I go back even further than, than Richard Morningstar. So I sometimes express my role as being that of a diplomatic archaeologist more than anyone who knows much going on. And if you, you know, have the misfortune to follow the social media, uh, you will see that I have some friends in Azerbaijan who also wonder why I continue to speak out. Um, don't I know first that the political opposition is meaningless? Uh, why do I hate Azerbaijan? Um, fine to talk about the political prisoners and concerns about their well-being, but what about fill in the blank? The double standard. What about Armenia? What about promoting color revolutions? And most important, and I think not without merit, Shouldn't you fix the problems in the United States before you give advice to Azerbaijan or other countries about human rights? Well, there's a good reason. Because these are universal values. These are values which the people of the United States and the government of the United States stands for, and which by its own free choice, Azerbaijan says it stands for as well. So um, watch the social media, I'm sure you know, some of this will come out. Um, it's really dangerous to read what you've written in the past, and, and I can't claim to be a historian or a writer of, of Dr. Hassan Lee's caliber, but back in 2001, I wrote a, a book, a time, or a article, Time for Change, U.S. Policy in the Transcaucasus. Century Foundation uh, published this. And it came at a time of a transition in, in the American administration from one president to another. We're at that same period now. And I think, uh, you know, we really need to look forward with a new administration in Washington in mind at this very important relationship. Um, when I wrote, wrote my, my monograph here, it was really looking at a relationship that was dictated by external factors. Russia, Iran, relations with the neighbors of Azerbaijan. But I think today, uh, if someone were to write a similar paper for the new administration that will come in next year in the United States, um, it would be a different kind of paper. It would focus mostly on internal factors. And let me just highlight some of those. And it may sound a bit like I'm at a different place than, than Ambassador Morningstar. I think we end up coming to the same place, but maybe in a different way. Um, I think the arrests and detentions of the opposition leaders, the independent media, the representatives of NGOs, uh, will go down as one of the major uh, negative factors in the internal development of Azerbaijan. It has removed people from 
uh, the space necessary in the public square to talk about the future of Azerbaijan and who comes in to fill that space. Um, I will say something later about Nardaran. There's also the issue of corruption, which has become, um, surprisingly to me, much more visible uh, in the media, including the Azerbaijani media. Uh, the removal of the head of the Ministry of National Security, of the Ministry of Communications, and large numbers of officials in both ministries. Uh, the apparent scandal in the International Bank of Azerbaijan, the largest commercial bank, um, involving uh, questionable loans to um, people of, uh, of influence in Azerbaijan underscores the depth to which the cancer of corruption has spread in that society. Uh, and that is a, a, major, a major factor that will, will shape the ability, not only of Azerbaijan to move forward, but the ability of American and other businesses to, uh, to be involved in that future. The third element has to be the weakened economy. I mean, we only, I, I, I teach a course in the geopolitics of energy security. Uh, at George Mason, we had a little contest to uh, guess the price of oil on December 2nd. Mm -hmm. uh, when I taught the course in December of uh, 20, in September of 2014, the price of oil was $100 a barrel. When I started the course in this past September, it was around 50, mm -hmm. and we're uh, we're below we're below 40, I think, mm -hmm. today. And going lower. <laughs> and going lower. But what this is mean, means for Azerbaijan, and even though the press has been focused on Russia and Saudi Arabia and, and the, the OPEC countries, producers like Azerbaijan are facing major, major economic consequences. Um, it has underscored the fact that economic reform was not taken at a time when the revenues were high. And now the country is being forced to address questions of economic reform uh, when the price of, of oil is low. The fourth element is this emergence, I don't know what to call it, radical Islam, um, the movement of Muslim unity. Uh, it's centered on Nadran. This was always a no-go zone for the government. Uh, you know, I, you, I don't know what's going on there, but I'm sorry to say I'm not sure the authorities in Baku do either. Um, but the potential that that represents coming at a time of these other factors, I think, underscores the need that the government must decide how it's going to address uh, what this may reflect in a religious sense, but what it reflects in a social sense. The lack of education for young girls, the lack of social services to a population that has few opportunities, and the fact that you've removed if you will, opposition forces with whom to engage on these questions and made that space available to these radical forces. Um, I think we will see more demonstrations of workers uh, in and around Baku who haven't been paid, who lack jobs in this new economic environment uh, and are going to demand improved governance. But there is one external factor that has carried through throughout this period, and that is the unresolved conflict regarding Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, one can question what role the U.S. Uh, should play in the region or in Azerbaijan, but there is nothing more important that we can do than to encourage, if not cajole, Armenia and Azerbaijan to finally resolve this conflict. So, what is to be done? some famous Russian ass. Mm -hmm. um, what can this administration do? So I'm gonna suggest a couple real radical things here uh, because we need to get the attention of both Armenia and Azerbaijan on Nagorno-Karabakh and stop them from blaming <coughs> us, the Minsk group, acts of God from settling this. I think this administration in Washington in the time remaining should go to the Congress and ask for the repeal of Section 907 of the Freedom Support Act. It was a bad idea when it was passed. It's a bad idea today. It serves no useful purpose. And it will, I think, get Armenia's attention. Um, 
that that we're 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 looking for a new a new uh, opening here. The second thing uh, to get Azerbaijan's attention is to apply travel sanctions on officials responsible for the arrest and detention of political prisoners. Um, Azerbaijan has a choice: release those people who shouldn't have been arrested in the first place, or face consequences for for that. When we have a new administration, I think there's going to be a need to, to redefine the term strategic relationship, strategic partnership, and ask the question whether we can have a strategic partnership without shared values. Um, we also need to look at our priorities in the region and see if there isn't a way, finally, to define a positive agenda for regional cooperation that would involve the EU and Turkey, but more importantly, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan regional energy grids, addressing environmental problems, addressing issues like trafficking in persons, and focus on Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan tells us that they want to have our respect, and they can have it, but we have to help them define how they can earn that, that respect. Uh, that can be a very important part of our diplomacy as well as our economic assistance. And I think we, we also have to, have to really help Azerbaijan redefine its energy priority. Uh, Ambassador Morningstar, more than anyone in the U.S. government, has been responsible for Azerbaijan being able to realize the potential in a very short period of time of these energy resources. But we are in a different world. Demand for gas in Europe is going down. Competitors for Azerbaijani oil are multiplying, including in this country? And how do you refocus an economy that has become so dependent on energy to look at a more diversified future? So I think there are opportunities, but ultimately we come back to the question of how Azerbaijan treats its own citizens, particularly those 90 plus who are in, in uh, prison today, and how do you create an environment where you can have a new economy, new entrepreneurship, free expression of ideas, and taking advantage of the opportunities that the people in the country of Azerbaijan have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I always enjoy uh, chairing for uh, diplomats because they always say uh, uh, quite a lot of wise words in a compressed period of time. <laughs> uh, Ambassador Yalowit, you're up next. I'll be the exception. <laughs> Thanks very much, Corey. Um, I feel a bit like the outlier here. Uh, I've not served as ambassador to Azerbaijan, and my experience in that country pales um, in comparison uh, to these two gentlemen and, and Corey as well. But I appreciate uh, Christian Osterman's invitation uh, to participate in this panel. And I want to begin by echoing what our previous speakers have done condolences uh, to those affected by this oil rig tragedy, and also congratulations to uh, Dr. Hassanli. I've never met you until 20 minutes ago, uh, but I know you and I respect you very much for what you stand for and the wonderful things that you have written. Um, I, both uh, Dick and Richard have spoken, I think, extremely well about uh, the U.S.-Azerbaijani relationship and what is going on internally. I'm going to take a few steps back with some observations that are based mainly uh, on my uh, experience now in the South Caucasus for, for roughly uh, 20 years and, and just studying it uh, you know, since being ambassador uh, to Georgia. I had an earlier uh, posting to the Netherlands, and that's when I first heard about the Dutch disease. And uh, the Dutch disease, I think most of you know, is you know when you have a, a source of newfound wealth uh, in the form of energy, and for the Dutch it was gas from the North Sea. Uh, this can really work to distort your economy in a number of ways. Um, you stop. Uh, investing in, in certain uh, industrial sectors that could really uh, promote the, uh, you know, the, uh, the economy more generally, and your currency appreciates, so uh, it means your exports, uh, you know, have a harder time. 
And that's precisely, you know, what happened uh, in, in the Netherlands, and that gave rise to a lot of writing about the Dutch disease. Well, I saw the same thing in, in Russia. We were there when the Soviet Union collapsed uh, in 1991. Uh, and saw, you know, again, the same disease of, you know, a huge amount of wealth uh, that now fell into questionable hands uh, in Russia. Uh, and the way that that has distorted uh, the Russian economy contributed enormously uh, to corruption uh, and really has come back to haunt Russia today uh, as a result of the uh, the, the significant fall in oil prices that Rich mentioned, um, but also the fact of the lack of reform and the lack of diversification. And obviously that is the same thing, you know, that has happened uh, in Azerbaijan. And Rich has already, you know, mentioned a number of these factors. But, you know, when you look at this uh, oil curse or energy curse world, worldwide, you know, it, it strikes me that unless the Azeri leadership, you know, pays attention to this and, you know, begins to diversify and, and do the economic reforms, uh, that they are in for a very, very, very serious situation. Uh, Rich has already mentioned the oil price decline, the saturation of the gas market, but in addition to that, uh, Russians are badly seeking, you know, new oil mar uh, gas markets, you know, themselves. Uh, the China market, I don't think, is going to end up uh, being anywhere near the cure-all that the Russians expected. And that means, you know, more competition uh, for Azerbaijan. And then you add to it uh, Iran. Uh, as a result of the nuclear deal, uh, it looks as if, you know, Iran is probably going to be able to enter energy markets again. And this is going to be another significant, you know, competitor uh, for Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan is, uh, as we know, the oil production is peaking and perhaps, you know, beginning to decline. They're looking for uh, energy for gas exports to replace that income, but I don't think, you know, it, you know, I don't think that that's going to happen. Uh, and Azerbaijan, you know, has made a very uh, integral argument to us that they are a strategic partner because of energy supply. And I think this is an argument that's not going to hold as much water, you know, going forward. And I think Azerbaijan is going to have to think very, very hard about its role and, uh, you know, the way it portrays itself as a strategic partner once this energy um, you know, component is, is not quite as strong. And that brings me to another point that has been mentioned here, and that is the, the lack of democracy and the human rights, the very serious human rights issues uh, in Azerbaijan. If the energy element in our relationship is not going to be as strong, I think the human rights and the democratization issues are certainly going to become uh, more important, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the, in, 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 in the uh, relationship. And um, I think also that for Azerbaijan's own interest, Azerbaijan, as many of us forget, is also a part of the European Partnership Program, but has really been a laggard because of the inability to move forward on, on a number of uh, areas that the EU wishes to see progress on, namely democratization and human rights. So, now, not much has happened, but Azerbaijan's neighbors, Georgia, Ukraine, uh, and Moldova, although Moldova is in a, a very, very difficult situation, are moving forward, you know, with the European Union, and certainly Georgia, you know, is trying to do that. So I think Azerbaijan, uh, you know, if there's ever going to be a hope for what, you know, Rich talked about, regional cooperation, uh, Azerbaijan, I think, is going to have to, you know, look to that relationship with the European Union uh, and try to improve that. And that is, you know, going to be difficult, but I think, you know, very, very, uh, you know, important. And again, as I look at Azerbaijan from just studying it and teaching a little bit about it, um, the Azeri foreign policy, uh, really, since uh, Aliyev, the elder Aliyev, came back as president, uh, really was a balanced, uh, you know, opening up to the West on terms of energy, but still keeping, you know, a good relationship, you know, with, um, with Russia. 
and not being as Western um, oriented as Georgia in terms of membership in NATO and other, other cooperation. But it seems to me that, that even that balanced foreign policy is, is increasingly endangered by the direction internally uh, that, that Azerbaijan is, is, is moving in uh, right now. Uh, it's very obvious that the Russians are not going to criticize Azerbaijan for lack of democracy and for you know, cracking down on human rights. But uh, it means also that implicitly, you know, Azerbaijan is probably going to get pulled more and more uh, into that type of thinking and that type of, of governance system. And I'm not sure if that is what Azeris have fought for and struggled for, um, you know, since uh, 1991, uh, you know, to, you know to, to end up in that way. And the final thing I wanted to mention, the thing that worries me perhaps more than anything else, um, is that as the internal political situation gets tougher and as the internal economic situation gets tougher, that there may be, even this may only be a 2 or 3 percent chance, but there may be the disposition to do something about Nagorno-Karabakh, to pull a Putin, you know, to use a very um, unexpected uh, sort of high-profile a foreign policy move to rally the troops and, and, and build up a, a, a strong sense of nationalism. And to me, that is a real danger. We've seen along the ceasefire line that um, more uh, destructive type weapons, you know, higher uh, velocities and, and, and more capacity to kill are being employed. And we've had enough incidents of shooting down airplanes and helicopters. The thing that concerns me is an unintended escalation through a series of events and the possibility of, uh, of, of uh, Baku launching something that I would call akin to the uh, uh, Yom Kippur War in the Middle East when uh, Sadat knew that he probably wasn't going to win, but the aim was to take territory back and demonstrate to his people uh, you know, that they could stand and fight. And this, to me, is a real danger. We've talked about uh, Turkey and, um, and, and Russia being in a very difficult situation right now. And if NK were to worsen, uh, you know, you, you need not imagine bringing in all these other powers, what, what a dangerous situation that could be. So I focus these remarks primarily on what I hope, you know, that the <coughs> government in Baku uh, will take into account and will take action based on, I think, some very serious challenges facing it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Yalowitz. Uh, and again, even more wise words in the compressed period of time. I appreciate uh, the remarks of all three panelists. Here's what I propose we do since Ambassador Morningstar has uh, a few minutes. Um, I'd like to um, <coughs> invite you to react to a few things um, that were said by uh, your co-panelists, and, um, and then um, if you need to leave, then we'll open the floor to other to questions and comments for the other panelists. But um, there are two things that I was struck by that I did want to ask your reaction to, uh, Ambassador. Um, the first is, um, uh, is was um, Rich's comments regarding um, the strategic partnership and the importance of having shared values in a strategic partnership with Azerbaijan. And, as you know, and as all of us know, we, the United States sometimes does have strategic partnerships with countries with whom we don't share values. Um, but I, I think, in general, this, this point is correct with, 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 with regard to Azerbaijan. But I wanted to get your sense on, on, on whether, it, why isn't it, why wouldn't it be possible to have a strategic partnership with Azerbaijan if we didn't share uh, common values? And the other thing I wanted to ask you about is this question of Azerbaijan's possible foreign policy orientation. Should the United States be concerned if Azerbaijan were to develop a much closer relationship with Russia? Perhaps, it's inconceivable now, but perhaps even join the Eurasian Union? Is this kind of outcome something that we should be on the watch for or not? <coughs> first, uh, first of all, on the shared values point, um, I'm not sure there are shared values. I mean, we are, um, we are when push comes to shove, to, to some extent, we are dealing with a different culture. We, diff we deal all the time uh, with countries that have different cultures. To me, if you make that assumption, I'd like to think there are shared values, but, if, but to make that assumption, our shared values needs to be their pragmatism. 
And my argument with them has been whether that, that look, we can't preach to you, but from a pragmatic standpoint, you really ought to, you know, you, re you really ought to do some things differently, particularly with respect to these prisoners, because what are you really gaining from it? And that, uh, that our common strategic interests are, I would argue with them, are more, are more important than what they're gaining from some of, frankly, what I would say, the very dumb things that they do. And so I, I don't think we can hope to uh, convert them to necessarily, at least many in their government, you, you don't want to be monolithic, I don't think we can con convert them necessarily to our way of thinking, but I think we can at least, uh, we can at least make the uh, pragmatic government, a uh, pragmatic uh, argument. Uh, <clears throat> I think on the Russia question, you ask, uh, I think you ask a very good question. And sometimes one wonders, you know, is it worth it? Uh, one of you mentioned, I think Ken, you know, the, the energy relationship is important, but at least one can ask the question, is it vital at this point? Is it even vital to Europe? Talking about the 10 BCM that will get of gas that would get to Europe by 2020, I think it is really important to have an alternative. Uh, uh, and to me, the question more is how important um, it is important, but how important is are the the security is the security relationship is the tenuous position that Azerbaijan is in, sitting between Iran, you know, three hours from Baku and Dagestan, two and a half hours from Baku, and we do cooperate a lot, and we still cooperate to to some extent. How important is it, as as uh, um, as Rich said, uh, to uh, and I think Ken as well, uh, to ensure that we don't, try to ensure that we don't have a blow up uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, you know, whether or not, hopefully we can get it resolved, and I think it is critical that we do everything we can to get it resolved. But at least if we can avoid a major escalation into what could be uh, a very dangerous conflict, uh, that's important, and we have to. And to do that, we, we, you know, we have we have to be involved. So, I don't really think there was much disagreement at the end of the day between the three of us. We all talked about different things. Uh, I think it is an important relationship. I think we hopefully can make Azerbaijan realize that it's important an important relationship. And from that standpoint, pragmatically, to get them. To act, uh, to act differently, hopefully differently on uh, on the democracy and the democracy and human rights issues. But it is. But you raise a very important question, and some people may differ and say, "Hey, it's not worth it if they want to be, if they want to act like Putin. You know, go be like Putin and go to the Russians." I I I don't buy that at least at this point. Thank you. Uh, we hope you're able to stay as long as possible and answer some other questions. Um, but if you do need to sneak out, I thank you very much for your participation on this panel. Thank you. And I do apologize. We have, I've, Faith and I have to go leave at 10 after. We have seven or eight minutes. And unfortunately, this, we just have to go. Let me ask another question to, to the panel. Um, I appreciate that Nagorno-Karabakh was raised. Um, and clearly, if we talk about the strate uh, a strategic partnership between Azerbaijan and U the United States, then the Azeris um, would be the first to say, if you truly believe in the strategic partnership, um, then um, we would expect a somewhat different approach to the NK conflict than the United States has taken. And there's, of course, a long history of dissatisfaction on the Azeri side. Um, my, my question is, uh, uh, is one, I mean, are, are there things that uh, any of you think we could be doing differently on the NK conflict strictly, or do you feel that we've, we've done the best we can, there really is no other uh, alternative? And two, um, is there, we, oftentimes there's talk of the way in which the conflict and the political regime are related in Azerbaijan, this uh, idea of, of, of keeping the conflict uh, alive, having uh, a, an adversary out there to shore up support for the regime. But I, I wonder um, if there was more liberalization in Azerbaijan, if the regime did engage in a path um, of, of democratization, do you think that would um, help 
them make their case more persuasively with regard to NK, or do you think that these issues really are unrelated in the way that we formulate policy? Well, I, I mean, I, th I think you could um, direct that question at Armenia as well, uh, because I think both Armenia and Azerbaijan, for their own domestic political reasons, have seen a value in keeping the conflict unresolved, uh, because to resolve the conflict requires compromise. And compromise would require both Yerevan and Baku to back away from very principled positions about the status of Nagorno-Karabakh, about the status of the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, and indeed about the relationship between, between the two countries. Um, Azerbaijan isn't looking for the U.S. to be more reasonable. Azerbaijan is looking for the U.S. to adopt the Azeri position about Nagorno-Karabakh. And that is the total reassertion of Azerbaijani sovereignty over Nagorno-Karabakh, just the way it was before the breakup of the former Soviet Union. Um, there's a misunderstanding of the role of mediator. Mediators don't take positions. Mediators create the conditions that allow the parties to a dispute to settle it. The parties to the dispute don't want to settle it. My great worry, you know, let's just assume there was suddenly a you know, a massive change internally in Azerbaijan and there was a peaceful um, change in, in the government and, and that you had a new government coming in. I think that new government would be even more nationalistic. Um, and I, I saw this again and again in the Balkans, where there was always hope for younger people, younger politicians who weren't tainted by the wars of the past. And yet they tended to be the ones who were most nationalistic because they only saw the other through the prism of war. So I, you know, it's still to be proven to me that um, the most vocal parts of the, the so-called external opposition, I'm talking about people mainly in the diaspora, would, would represent, in terms of Nagorno-Karabakh, a greater possibility of resolving the conflict. That's why this government needs to do it. That's why the, the government in Yerevan needs to do it. Because the leadership is in a position, if they prepare the population to accept the idea of compromise, that then you can settle the conflict with the support of the international community. But to constantly point the finger back to Washington, Paris, and Moscow, respectively, as being responsible for not settling it is simply irresponsible. Um, I would take a, I don't disagree at all with what Rich has said, but I would take a slightly different uh, tack. Uh, I now direct an MA program at Georgetown University in conflict resolution. And um, I think when you look at NK, uh, it's always good to keep in mind, you know, that the uh, national fronts in both countries, you know, Ar Armenia and Azerbaijan, really came about because of NK and that that now for probably more than 30 or f almost 40 years really has defined you know the way the two uh, look at each other and we're now two or three generations you know into um, you know groups on both sides that have he heard nothing but a negative you know a narrative against the other uh, and that is going to be very, very difficult, you know, to deconstruct uh, and, and unwind. Uh, the failure of leaderships on both sides to, you know, to talk about compromise, uh, to, to open up doors, you know, to dialogue, you know, between people, uh, to stop demonizing and blaming the other. Uh, these are going to be extremely difficult, uh, you know, obstacles uh, to overcome. And what worries me, uh, I'm very familiar with what happened in 2008 with Georgia and Russia, and everyone thought that that was a frozen conflict. Well, it was not. And a number of us saw it coming and were writing about it, and what we really decried at the time uh, was the failure, and a lot of it was directed at our home capital here, to really get involved at a very high level. And I'm afraid, you know, when I look at NK, that it's probably going to take the head knocking of a Richard Holbrook type situation, you know, to really get to the bottom of it. But that may not happen, you know, short of the kind of 
uh, escalation that I'm most concerned about, which may, you know, may get uh, out of control. And to answer your question, Corey, I too feel that even if there were a new liberal government, you know, that came to power uh, in, in Azerbaijan, for the reasons Rich outlined, I think it would be very difficult for them to take a, a more, um, you know, sort of enlightened approach. I think that the sides are so dug in that it's going to be very, very difficult. I guess, I guess my last comment, uh, first just on the question of mediation, and my wife over there is a, media, is a mediator, uh, and I think there are debates among mediators whether you do, as you said, Rich, just sit back and not suggest anything and let them talk and so forth and hopefully push them a little bit towards a resolution or whether you make positive suggestions. Uh, I wish sometimes now as being outside of the government that we have, that we, that we be and hopefully will be somewhat more proactive in making suggestions. Whether it gets to the point of actually proposing a draft agreement uh, is something else, but it's at least something that ought to be, uh, ought to be considered. It's still going to be extraordinarily difficult there, and I, I don't say this in a pejorative way, but I, I really question the political will on both sides, uh, and for the reason that from an Armenian standpoint, any, from a political standpoint, any resolution, whatever it is, they lose something. From an Azerbaijani standpoint, anything that's not a total victory, let's say, uh, uh, Azerbaijan loses something. And it's a, and, and NK has been a unifier, again, and I think you're right, whichever, whoever is the government. I agree with you, Ken, and maybe even feel a little bit more strongly that I think there is a danger at some point that if the parties don't get it resolved, that it could really escalate. I don't know how much the Russians at this point wa really want a resolution in spite of their talk. They maintain the most leverage over both sides. Uh, if, there's, um, you know, if there's no resolution, they're selling a lot of arms to Azerbaijan, I guess mainly giving arms to Armenia. Um, so they're making, they're making money uh, with respect to the deal. My concern would be that at some point, I think the military balance, my own just opinion, is the military balance could shift over the coming years more towards Azerbaijan uh, as they uh, uh, modify their military, as they buy, as they buy more, as they buy more arms. And if it can't be resolved, I do have the fear that it could escalate into uh, r into a major conflict. And if the Rus the Russians could say, I'm not saying this will happen. It's probably unlikely, but you know, okay, you join the Eurasian Energy Union, don't go, through, go, don't go into Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, and maybe they'd also say don't sell any more of any additional gas to the West, and they, they, don't, you know, don't go into Nagorno-Karabakh, don't cross into Armenia, but we'll look the other way if, you know, you walk into the occupied territories. Uh, unlikely, but possible, and maybe that leads to a whole Brookian kind of solution, I don't know. Uh, hopefully we don't get that far. And now I'm sorry, I've got to go. <laughs> as, as, as someone who had his head knocked by Dick Holbrook, I wouldn't wish that on <laughs> either, either Armenians or Azerbaijanis. But just to, I, I mean, I do agree with Dick. I mean, uh, my idea of a mediator isn't someone who sort of, you know, arranges the table and leaves the room. And I don't think that's been what the U.S. and, and the Minsk Group partners have done. But what's been lacking is the willingness of the two parties to come into the room at all and to seriously address the issues that must be addressed if you're going to settle this, this peacefully. So, I wonder who would be the next Holbrook to knock heads. <laughs> I, it's a good question. I, I, I mean, there are so many specific features of that time and place. I, I mean, people talk about, you know, let's have a Holbrook approach to Syria. I tell them, you are nuts. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, the situations are just so different, and I, I really don't see our, the conflict uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan regarding Nagorno-Karabakh amenable to that, that kind of diplomacy. If the parties aren't, I mean, at Dayton, the two parties were exhausted by war and wanted to find a way out. I don't really think we're there yet. 
um, in fact, moving in the other direction. All right, let's, uh, we've got some time for some questions. Over here. And please identify yourself. I know we talked a lot uh, with uh, Ambassador Kozlaric on this issue, on Nagorno-Karabakh. Sorry, could you identify yourself again? Uh, I'm Sevinj Osman Gize. Um, I'm a journalist from Azerbaijan. Um, we did talk um, a lot with Ambassador Kozlaric on the uh, forecast of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, talks and what happens if uh, there is a more new or more liberal government uh, in Azerbaijan. I think uh, it's, in a way, a little dangerous uh, to assume that the new liberal government in Azerbaijan will be more nationalistic. Um, and in fact, if you look at the opposition in Azerbaijan, there is a, and we have obviously one very brilliant uh, representative of these forces, resistance forces, uh, sitting right here, and perhaps we could ask uh, Mr. Hassan himself to uh, share his take on this. But uh, looking at the differences in opinions, and the opposition and government uh, opinions vary in a wide range of issues, but not in Nagorno-Karabakh. It's nearly identical when it comes what would you do, how would you handle. I would also mention that the reason why the presidential terms limit in Azerbaijan was lifted was under pretext of Nagorno-Karabakh, as if there is a war so we cannot have, uh, we cannot change the presidency, so we end up with uh, practically eternal presidency in Azerbaijan. So I think it's in a way uh, dangerous to look at this in uh, this way that uh, the new government will be more nationalistic, will be uh, more radical, uh, more radicalized on this issue. And I think um, it will be interesting just to hear what Hassan Lee thinks on this. Thank you. Any reaction? Yeah. Well, uh, look, I, I put this starkly because the assumption always is, and I'm not, uh, let's just make an abstract statement here. When, when you're dealing with, with a situation like this where there's a, a current government that seems to be immovable, that somehow a new government will be movable, I don't think we can make that assumption. Uh, I think you really have to wait and see. But I just note that there are voices among forces, not necessarily in Azerbaijan, but would be qualified as opposition forces, who see the Nagorno-Karabakh issue as the real selling point for them with the Azerbaijani public. If they can take a harder line, than the current regime, they will get more political support. And so I, you know, I'm not putting uh, putting uh, Jamil in that category. I'm just saying that there are voices out there like that. Yeah, I would just uh, remind uh, personalities, political parties are very important, but national interests tend to be pretty well established and as I think that's what you're dealing with here as I tried to say this goes back a number of years right now and to me it's going to be very very hard how do you deconstruct years of education uh, that Armenia or Azerbaijan is the enemy uh, you know that what is going on is illegal or justified depending on which side you're on and uh, you know that until that demonizing ends and somehow or another you're able to treat the other side as a human being and compromise, it's going to be very, very difficult. Questions? Ross Johnson, Wilson Center. Um, I, I think it was Ambassador of Morningstar who, who um, made the strongest argument as I heard him, um, sort of the appeal to the Azeri government, why don't you be more realistic, more pragmatic, is the implication that an authoritarian regime can um, be more relaxed about political prisoners and civil society and still be an authoritarian regime? Because if not, then this advice um, isn't going to be very well received. Well, I, you know, my experience was not with President Ilham Aliyev, but with President Heyer Ali. And, um, I, you know, I'm very struck. It, it, it was not a bed of roses in terms of 
to use flowers as an analogy in this situation, for democratic forces, freedom of expression, uh, or religious freedom. But on the other hand, you know, there were not 90 political prisoners, uh, including people who were rounded up on trumped-up charges. Um, there was not the suppression of freedom of expression as currently goes on. Um, and, and, you know, Hader Aliyev was confident of his control and leadership capabilities and understood the importance of truly a balanced relationship between the West, Russia, and Iran. And, and you know, was, was conscious of concerns of the United States about human rights issues. So I, I'm not sure that's the model I'd want to put out there but, but, you know, there, there's, let me put it this way. Just because this, the current government in Azerbaijan is an authoritarian, less than fully democratic regime, there's nothing to prevent that government from releasing these political prisoners and still remaining in power if that's, that's the, the support that they have from the, the Azerbaijani people. And they tell us that's what these elections pose. So I don't think... You know, releasing political prisoners necessarily ends up with a, a revolution or a change in government, and it may not even result in a lessening of the, the autocratic methods that are currently used. And if I could say a word um, from my experience in Belarus and watching what's happening there over 20 years of Lukashenko. Uh, um, Lukashenko, you know, has become somewhat more pragmatic. Um, in the, in the wake of, you know, the annexation of Crimea and the Russian, you know, separatist support in Ukraine, you know, he has recognized, you know, that Belarus, you know, potentially is under threat. And he has moved, you know, uh, very slightly but perceptibly, you know, to a more balanced uh, foreign policy, and he has released political prisoners. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, there's a, you know, a rose garden there in Belarus. I've been, I have been and will remain very critical of Belarus, but I would agree with Rich, you know, that, you know, that the regimes are capable of doing certain things when they feel they're pretty much still in control, and it is in their interest to do it. So it can happen. More questions? While, while you're thinking, I, I'll ask another question. Then <laughs> we put everyone to the, sleep. I mean, we we have noticed uh, a trend, not only from Aliyev Senior to uh, the current president, um, but also a trend within um, his tenure as well to uh, a hardening of the of the regime, especially in the last several years, um, whether connected to the Arab Spring or the the, the Euro Maidan as well. And we've mentioned the kinds of arrests and crackdowns that have taken place. Um, my question is how, in addition, it's not only that this affects the U.S. Azeri relationship because of the crackdown, pure and simple, but the kinds of people that are being in prison now are not only people that we uh, often sympathize with, but these are people that are that do actually work for organizations that receive U.S. Uh, assistance and support. And I've been wondering, and I'm curious what your take is on this, uh, how much of this should be seen as a, a, as a, a, um, a Putin-like attack on, on support, Western U.S. particular support of NGOs. And if that is the case, and that is how we interpret this, um, then is our reaction, has it been adequate? Or should we um, be looking to adopt a harder line towards this crackdown in particular? Well, I, uh, you know, David Kramer and I have been very outspoken on our view of that, and that is that we should should take a harder line. We have not stood up for organizations like RFERL or for the American NGOs like IREX. Uh, we haven't stood up as we should about religious freedom in, in Azerbaijan. And, um, uh, you know, so, so I think there's, uh, there's that where we perhaps have, have let down our own, own ideals uh, because there were other issues of greater importance, whether it was northern supply route to Afghanistan, energy, um, you know, fill in the blank. Um, but, 
I, you know, I think it is uh, a lot of these measures are directed specifically against the United States for exactly the same reason that Putin has directed his measures against the United States because these organizations and what they represent are seen as threats to the survivability of the regime. And um, it, it, it's, I, I think it shows a lack of confidence in their own ability to, um, you know, maintain, uh, maintain uh, control based on some principle of uh, people determining their political leadership. Uh, I, I think ideas scare them. Uh, I, I just can't understand why they would um, arrest one uh, female journalist and one female NGO uh, representative whose only weapon against the regime were words, or was words, or was word, <laughs> however you want to say it. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a, you know, kind of a, 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 a total capitulation, um, you know, to the, uh, developing the kind of society that everyone hoped for, that, that even this government talked about achieving, of a Western European oriented, uh, with all due respect to Ambassador Mornings, are a value based <laughs> relationship with the West and the United States in particular. Yeah, I think we have to tread carefully here. Uh, you know, watching what's happened, you know, with Russia, every step that we have taken, you know, is then used, you know, by the government just to. Uh, strengthen their arguments, see they really are our enemies, you know, these steps are all, you know, designed, you know, to impugn our honor, our, our integrity, uh, and that they really are after, you know, regime change. So I think we have to be very, very careful, you know, in, in what we do. My own feeling uh, is that both Putin and Mr. Aliyev are digging themselves into deeper and deeper holes. and. I happen to believe, you know, that we are stronger over the long term and that, you know, uh, again, all, all the years overseas as an ambassador, I concluded that the best thing we have going for us is, is allegiance to our own system and our own values to be true to them. And I do think that in the end is what's going to be definitive here. I'm sorry, just one thing that well, a lot has troubled me in recent days about what's been going on. Um, but a comment that, uh, that I had heard uh, that basically was along the lines, if you would, you in a collective sense in the United States uh, would not be so uh, vocal uh, about uh, Leila, Hajia, the other political prisoners, that then it would allow the government to <laughs> do the right thing. Um, there's an expression in English for that that's called blackmail. Yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, you know we're, uh, Americans are in a peculiar position here. Uh, we can shut up. We can not say anything about this. Uh, or we can say, listen, this is what we believe. You know, people have the right to determine their own future, to express their ideas, to worship as they choose. Uh, that's not an American imposition. That is a universal value. And you can go back to the person whose name graces these halls, and the 14 points, the end of World War I, to see, see those values. Um, so it's, you know, I don't think this is anything that we, we serve ourselves or, or indeed serve the poor people who are suffering as they are in, in prison for their belief in those values by keeping quiet. We have to be careful, but on the other hand, I don't think we should mislead people in thinking that we have a strategic relationship that is based on pay no attention to the person behind the curtain who's doing all kinds of mischief. Thank you. I'm going to give the final question to Dr. Sorrell. Thank you very much for very th thorough and thought-provoking presentations. We've um, s centered our discussion almost exclusively on an American help, intervention, alliance, resolution of conflict. What about the Europeans? Mm. I mean, these people are in Europe. And I think um, 
not that the Americans should uh, lead from behind. I'm not suggesting that. I think the world needs America to lead, not from behind, forward. Uh, but I think there may be a place here for a more complex and nuanced intervention that is not exclusively positioning us as a savior of Nagorno-Karabakh or Azerbaijan or Armenia, but a, a nuanced and, and integrated uh, response that in fact may help prevent the cataclysmic potential that NK holds and the neighborhood as a whole. Any thoughts on that, uh, th those perspectives? Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the role of Europe, the role of the EU is, is extremely important here. And we've, we've seen that, you know, in, in other regions of the world, including in Eastern Europe and the Balkans, when Europe and the United States agree, a lot can be accomplished. Now, you know, we, we are on both sides of the Atlantic going through difficult times of our own. And I don't think we should minimize um, the challenges that uh, events in both the Middle East, Paris, and San Bernardino, California, impose on this, this situation. But when we do work together, it can, it can be to the good. Azerbaijan would like to have a good relationship with Europe, I'm convinced. Uh, set aside some of their their statements lately, but, but I really do think that uh, they, they really do see, not just as an energy market, but otherwise, connections to Europe uh, as important. And it's, it's always hard to get Europe together with a common voice on, on an issue like this, but still, it's worth the effort. And I think in many respects, we and our European friends see things the same way. It's always hard to kind of get that synergy <laughs> of European and U.S. together advancing on a problem. So the French role in the Minsk group is critical in that regard uh, to deal with the NK conflict. But also on human rights, uh, Europeans setting aside the Council of Europe have been very supportive of the same principles that we've, that we've espoused. So the potential's there, you're absolutely right. It's not going to be something that we can do on our own. It never was, um, but it's going to be hard work. Yeah, I agree very much with what Rich has said. I think the European Union in the wake of Ukraine and you know, what, what happened with Maidan and um, you know, the ouster of, of Yanukovych and things of that nature and sort of not being, unfortunately, fully prepared uh, for the Russian reaction uh, to the European Partnership Initiative, which I think is a, is a terrific initiative. The sense that I have is that, you know, the Europeans are really sort of looking that over again uh, to see what uh, should be done to change, modify, and I was very um, pleased that they have opened um, or reached some type of a tentative agreement with Armenia to try to rescue parts of the agreement that the Armenians you know, had ag almost agreed to but then walked away at the very last minute under Russian pressure. And I think they're also looking at ways uh, to perhaps uh, let countries like Armenia, which are going to join the, the Russian, the Eurasian Economic Union, also participate somehow uh, you know, with, the, um, you know, with the European Union. So I agree with you, and I think the European Union has to do some real uh, creative thinking about how they're going to deal, uh, how are they going to remodel that initiative, if you will, and deal with countries like Azerbaijan, because you can't forget Azerbaijan either, uh, and the model that they have used, you know, which has restricted the dealing with Azerbaijan, is they've demanded, you know, changes on human rights and democracy, and obviously that's going to have to be, you know, kept in place. But I think they're going to have to be some more imaginative ways as well, you know, as they're reaching out to Armenia to reach out to Azerbaijan. But I totally agree that Europe has an important role to play and that, you know, this is something we've been writing about for years, uh, that more cooperation between the United States and the EU in, in approaching that part of the world is really necessary. So, very good point. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hassanli, on behalf of all the panelists, I just want to say again how grateful we are to have this opportunity to serve as a prelude to uh, your presentation and to honor you 
uh, your work and our shared values. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists, and thank you very much to, uh, to all of you for joining us. Mr. Ambassador was very interesting Thank presentation. You. I'm going to stay down to very you. useful presentation. I want to listen now to your presentation. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 yeah. but there have been. Oh,